our daily routine, believe it or not, is even unpredictable. There is one thing that is constant, though. There is one thing that is constant in our life. There is one thing that is constant on our earth. There is one thing that is constant in the world. And it's called change. <laughs> Doesn't that just put you right on? <laughs> and oftentimes, that change, even if it is, even if you win the lottery, even if that change seems and sounds very positive, oftentimes that change means trouble to us or anxiety. And of course, the key is that we never know when it's going to come. Oh yes, there are changes we plan for in our life. We graduate, we get married, we do all those things that we think we can predict. Or we think we know how it's going to turn out. But we can't predict when the change comes. We don't get a message. So we don't get the message that trouble is coming. We may get a phone call in the middle of the night. Oh, now we might get the text. <laughs> we may get the doctor saying something to us. We, there's so many. We may hear it on the TV. We may read it in the newspaper. We, there's so much change coming at us. Now, you also know, even though I don't know that this is a constant, many of us, most of us, don't want that change. We don't like to admit it, because we're modern people. We like to move on, keep up with the times, get the new technology, get the new car, get the new outfit. Well, not exactly. But, we like to think that we can adapt. But then we find ourselves saying, Oh, I remember when. Or what we all long for that mythical thing called the good old days. I don't care how young or old you are. We somehow have this idea that the past was better. Or some of us even say, I am not paying any attention to that trouble. I am going to pretend like it doesn't happen. <laughs> I'm going to pretend like it isn't happening. I am cheery. I am happy. I always have a smile on my face. Nothing is wrong with me. Nothing troubles me. Don't tell me about the news. I'm not reading it anymore. I am happy no matter what. Or we eat too much, we drink too much, we sleep too much. We all find our ways to deal with the change. And sometimes it's anger, sometimes it's great fear. So the change is But it's Scott Peck, a well-known writer that many of you might have heard, Scott Peck says, what tests us or what shows who we are is how we deal with the change. All right, get happy. <laughs> and let's go see what Mark Mark had to say in the scripture about this change. Let's go see or take another look at how Jesus dealt with some changes. Or maybe a better way to put it, how the characters in the reading this morning in Mark 5 dealt with it. And as we talk a little bit about the three main characters, three main characters, try to imagine which one of these characters represents you today? Or try to think of which one of these characters you 
most identified. The first one, Jarius. Jarius is a man of authority. He is a leader in the synagogue. He's not just a member.
I could not presume to have the answer. But from these stories, I think I can say, and I know what you did not know what I was preaching at. <laughs> I can say that God will see who you really are. But it's important to let other people see who you are.
not going to embarrass my own children by calling them Willie. <laughs> but I am going to take a moment to have an object lesson to think about something. Um, I want you all to think about and maybe shout out an answer. What is something that needs first to be empty before it can be filled? Turn to the Bible for the next scripture lesson, which is John 2, verses 1 through 10. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, Oh, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification. Each would hold twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So as we prepare for the message that I'm bringing to you, I'd like to ask you to breathe with me. Breathing in and out. Slowly and enjoying. In and out. And in.
breathing is the simplest and most universal example of the natural cycle of life. We let a breath go, we make a space, we clean out the old air, we pause in that moment of emptiness, and then we receive, slowly, with focus, fully, mindfully, and thankfully, every time. Well, life is like that. You clear a space, you prepare for something new, you pause, thinking about what you are about to receive, you give thanks, and then you receive. Breathing is not just about the in. Oh, I have another object lesson. I want everybody to breathe in, and breathe in, and breathe in, and breathe in. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my point is, it takes equal amounts of breathing in and breathing out in order for it to be effective. So I want to focus on the breathing out, the emptying, because the rest of the week, the world will focus on having you take in. I want us to think about clearing out. Thinking about synonyms for that are letting go, cleaning, preparing a way, preparing a space, releasing. We all do this every day. Sometimes it's good to let go and clean. Sometimes it's not. The good times are things like when you clean the house in anticipation of a beloved guest coming to visit. You clear off your kitchen table to play a board game. You set up a gift table at a wedding reception. You clean your car for a first date. You spring clean at your house to refresh your home and the energy in it. A few years ago, my wonderful husband, God bless him, he cleaned out our barn. I think it had never, ever been done. In order to clean out the barn, he arranged for an empty dumpster. It was huge. It was empty. It was necessary. And he cleared out his own schedule. He made room in the weeks ahead to get this job done. Clearing room in the schedule. We can clear room in a space, but we can also clear room in time. You can cancel all your appointments for the day when a friend of yours needs you. You clear out space in your schedule when you take a vacation. And vacation means vacating, leaving, making a space. There are also times when you don't want to let go, and you must. You have to let go of who you were in your 20s, and that exciting, adventurous, energetic person you were. You have to let it go. You have to keep moving forward. You find the love of your life and you get married, beautiful, but you have to let go of your single self, the self that had your own apartment, your own style of decorating, your own money, maybe even your own name. When you become a parent, you let go of your independence. You let go of regular sleep. Yeah. You might even let go of your job if you think it's important to stay home, or if you don't stay home, you let go of the care of your child to someone you trust, but either way, you let go. You let go of the ability to go wherever, whenever you want. My mother once told me that life is a series of letting go. I think she was trying to get me out of the house. <laughs> At least the bar is clean. <laughs> Either way, space and time, we're talking about a big empty space. I was thinking about the myths, the legends, our, our own teaching about how the world was formed. And it started with a big nothingness 
In Greek mythology, the world was created from a big void, and that void was called chaos. In Christianity, the earth was formless void. Darkness covered the face of the deep, and a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. It starts, whatever it is, with a clean slate. The Bible tells us that John, in John 1, urged the people to make straight a way for the Lord, prepare a path. And the people didn't know what was coming, but he said, just make it, just clear the way. So whether it's perceived as a good thing or a bad thing, or somewhere in between, I'm here to urge you to make the practice of emptying, to actively prepare for something, to let go, clear your body, your mind, your spirit, make a space for God's Holy Spirit, make a space for other people, make a space for God's gift, make like, imagine for yourself, the wedding reception with that empty table ready for everyone to bring gifts. Make that in your mind. I've drawn from a couple of other traditions about clearing space. The Native Americans had a special practice of smudging, which is taking a, a clump of plants, um, an herb like sage, and they smoke the end and they clear the air. They have a prayer for this which goes, may your hands be cleansed that they create beautiful things. May your feet be cleansed that they might take you where you most need to be. May your heart be cleansed that you might hear its messages clearly. May your throat be cleansed that you might speak rightly when words are needed. May your eyes be cleansed that you might see the signs and wonders of the world. May this person in this space be washed clean by the smoke of these fragrant plants. And may that same smoke carry our prayers spiraling to the heavens. The Buddha said, when you let go, you create space for better things to enter your life. And Anne Hauskamp, a contemporary Christian writer, wrote, Humbly let go. Let go of trying to do. Let go of trying to control. Let go of my own way. Let go of my own fears. Let God blow his wind, his trials, oxygen for joy's fire. Leave the hand open and be. Be at peace. Bend the knee and be small, and let God give what God chooses to give, because he only gives love, and whisper a surprised thanks. This is the fuel for joy's flame. Fullness of joy is discovered only in the emptying of will. And I can empty, I can empty, because Counting his graces has awakened me to know he cherishes me, holds me, passionately values me. I can empty because I am full of his love. Now that we've emptied, we take this moment to be with the space that we've cleared before anything comes rushing back in. Be patient and wait. Once you've cleared your schedule, don't do anything. Enjoy your clean kitchen before the guests come. And in this waiting patiently, give thanks. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am. Be still and know that. Be still and know. Be still. Be. 
that same author, Anne Voskamp, wrote that Thanksgiving, or the Greek word eukaristeo, eucharist, Thanksgiving, giving thanks, always precedes the miracle. So what if rather than giving thanks for what you have received, you give thanks for what we are about to receive? Remember, that's how Grandma used to give grace before the meal. Before the meal, give thanks first. Make a space and receive. That's faith. That's faith. You won't be disappointed. You also won't necessarily get what you thought you would. But it will be better. It will be from God. God is always giving, always loving you, always. And you, it's your job to empty your vessel in order to receive. I have to throw in a little science. And I might be wrong. I might be corrected by my science daughter. Two things I think of, actually a third one just entered my mind, when I think of making space, I think of a vacuum cleaner. Now, this is the way I think a vacuum cleaner works. There's a big black hole inside of my vacuum cleaner that is a vacuum, that is a nothingness, an emptiness, but because of its emptiness, when you open an entrance, it sucks in the dirt, right, Sage? Isn't that exactly how it works? <laughs> Uh, another image I have, which is probably wrong, but I'm up here. So, <laughs> it's, if you're at the shore and someone says, how come there's a breeze coming in from the ocean? I officiously answer, it's because when the air rises from the heat of the ground, it creates a space. And so the air from the ocean comes in and fills it. I think that's the way it happens. There's a space made, and the air comes in, and there's a breeze. Do you know, I heard someone sneeze, and that reminded me that in the old days, when someone would sneeze, they would say, God bless you. They might still. Do you know why? They used to think that when you sneeze, and you shed all of what was in you, you'd better be blessed first before the devil could come in and fill that space. In Spanish, they say, Jesus. I think it's for the same reason. They say, Jesus, like, bless her quickly, because something might come in to fill that space. So, when you empty yourself, there's no need to worry that you won't be filled because you will. But what you should worry about or think about, don't worry, is what you let come in. There's a Chinese style of arranging your furniture called feng shui. And some part of that is to remove all the furniture from one room, let's say your living room. Take everything out, sit with the space, then only bring back in that which gives you joy. The rest you could give to someone who may need it. So once you've created the space, be mindful of what you fill with. Once you've cleaned out your barn, oh, we did put things back in, didn't we? Yeah. But before we did start putting things back in the barn, we did take a moment to think about the possibilities. That was fun, just that moment. And what we did, one of the things we did, was we cleared a space on our schedule one week in August, a few years ago, and we invited our kids' friends to come over and create theater in the barn. It was, it was fantastic. It, and we had no expectations. We had cleared our mind and the barn and said, come, do something. And they did, and it was beautiful. It was art. It was fun. It was vacation. So you can clear your space, you can clear your time, and watch out what comes back in, something will come in. You can clear it again. But even from your time, think about when you wake up first thing in the morning, if you can, delay for something like a half an hour turning on your device. 
right? I know it's hard. Delay answering messages. Just sit with the nothingness for half an hour and let yourself think about what you might want. And then you can turn on your phone and respond to messages. So what are the things that you want? I want you to think carefully, prayerfully, and gratefully. And then ask, and you shall receive. In the natural flow of life, consider the letting go, the breathing out as the first step. And give thanks, and then receive. So please join me to breathe again. And this time, let's start with the breathing out. Okay? Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Give thanks. Breathe in. Prepare to receive. Give thanks and receive. Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. 
He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. So that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Ends this morning's reading. May God bless our hearing and understanding of this holy word. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come before you in hopes of hearing a reminder in a new way of the ways that you bless and forgive us so that we can learn to live for you in your light and to your glory. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It is good to be back with you all this morning. I will admit a bit of culture shock, though. Spent the last week away at summer camp at Silver Lake Conference Center in Sharon, Connecticut. Now, Silver Lake is owned and operated by the Connecticut Conference of the United Church of Christ, and with the new Together as One Tribe Conference, it is now our ministry too. And it is a ministry, let me tell you, that transforms lives. At camp, there are campers like our very own Gabe Wilson and Izzy Weimer also called conferees. There is administrative staff and program staff and resource staff and volunteer staff like me and the youngest staff called Camp Family, 16 and 17 year old youth who are support staff for the camp. It's their first job. Their resume and their lives are transformed by the experience and bonds that they form as they learn to live independently under the care of a camp mom and dad, and to provide valuable labor to their brothers and sisters in Christ. All of those people together form an intentional community that allows them to live in alignment with the greatest commandments, loving themselves, loving each other, loving God, and the camp dad's loving creation. It fits right in with our National United Church to Church of Christ theme of the three great loves, love of children, love of creation, and love of neighbor. In this community, everyone can live their faith full time, and nobody looks at them funny. It's totally normal for them to express gratitude or offer profuse verbal emotional encouragement. You can do it! You can do it! I know you can! I have faith in you! I love you! Imagine if we all walked around and heard that in our daily lives. Or they receive or share patience with a camper who might make others want to smash something. Or for everyone to walk around with a water bottle and also notice when water is being wasted. Or is that food compostable or non-compostable? And is that non-compostable non-food waste or compostable non-food waste or non-compostable food non-waste? Uh, it gets awfully confusing. But in caring for the creation, for our beautiful planet, 
they learn to be attentive to what is around them. When a camper is upset, there is no shortage of others circling around them to offer comfort, support, and love, and it is amazing to see their faces reflect their emotions and how they are transformed. This week, I watched as campers struggled and overcame homesickness, physical illness, fear of heights, insecurity about swim tests, loneliness, lack of knowledge, meeting new people, and more. And at the end of the week, our campers sat in a circle and shared out loud and honestly, one by one, something that they appreciated about every other camper in our conference. I watched as their countenances glowed. We know what it feels like to receive affirmation of our God nature within each of us. Lives are transformed in this outdoor ministry. Campers begin to attend camp as young as toddlers at family camp, and they step their way along the journey from upper elementary conferences through high school conferences and beyond. Campers transform into counselors, and counselors transform into deans who plan the week of camp and recruit volunteers. One of our counselors this week, her name was Ashley, was originally a conferee during my co-dean's previous life as a counselor 17 years ago. There are long and deep, strong roots. And it provides a foundation that allows for transformation like you wouldn't believe. Camp life is a stepping stone path to transformation, much like our scripture this morning. Paul's letter addresses hostility, division, self-interest more than any other topic in the letter. And it leads many scholars to believe that his primary concern was not doctrinal about what we should believe, but behavioral. The main theme of Ephesians is in response to the newly converted Jews who often separated themselves from their Gentile brethren. The unity of the church, especially between Jew and Gentile believers, is the keynote of the book. It was about transforming entrenched beliefs, habits, and cultural norms to allow for unity across differences. The author lays out a series of stepping stones, blessings that have been given, on which the ancient church could traverse the cultural stream, laying out a new direction. He lays out the path toward glorifying God. You can hear the stones being placed step by step before the hearers. God blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. God destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the pleasure of his will. God has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will. Could you feel the stepping stones going across the way? Paul's letter, by the way, is categorized Deuteropauline, which is a fancy way of saying it was written by someone like Paul. Probably not Paul, someone who wanted to be sure that the young church would continue in strength and unity, remembering all those blessings that were bestowed upon them through Jesus Christ. Sound familiar? Yeah. We could all use a little reminder of our salvation and blessings. In religion, a blessing is the infusion of something with holiness, spiritual redemption, or divine will. We could use a little reminder that we are blessed and holy and redeemed. Whether we are struggling with cultural pressure to be perfect, or if our personal relationships are strained, or if the organizations to which we are aligned are in a state of flux, or whether we are bothered by the political atmosphere in our country right now. 
we could use a little reminder that we are saved and blessed. We have been given the gift of forgiveness. Each and every one of us is redeemed, forgiven. Each and every one of us is invited into the circle of love that transforms the world. That transformation happens when we live the Jesus way, forgiven, imparting wisdom and understanding, and glorifying God. In doing so, the mystery of God's plan has been revealed. It is our inheritance that, like God, is everlasting and never-ending was always here, was always will be. There is enough redemption to go around and it will be transformative and for God's glory. How are we transformed? We accept and live into our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. And we no longer live in fear. We live too blessed to be stressed. Sometimes we worry. That transformation means giving up what we have, that we'll lose our blessings. But that goes against our God, who is limitless. When we tend God's economy, the economy of love and blessing, then grace overflows. What would it mean to really live in the trust that we are forgiven, that even now God is transforming us through love? Love that is never ending, and there's plenty to go around. God's love and forgiving blessings are endless. That is shown even grammatically in today's reading. In the original Greek translation, all of these 11 verses are one long sentence with clause after clause after clause after clause after clause, offering the drumbeat of our inherited blessings. Now, I know there are some English teachers among us. I know they would not be pleased. When we live and love into the inheritance that has been given us, we will continue to strength. Because the fear of our not enoughness or others' judgment of us will dissipate. When we live and love into our inheritance, we circle around each other and we say, I know you can do it. I have faith in you. You're strong. You're brave. You can do this. You can live the Jesus way. When we live and love into our inheritance, we are transformed into confident Christians, ready to swim upstream if necessary to bring about God's glory. And it is glorious, my friends. I know it. I've seen it. I've seen it in your faces, I've seen it in the faces of the children at Silver Lake Conference Center and other summer camps, and I'm about to see it again as we head to the Eastern Regional Meeting. God's economy is all blessings, friends, and those blessings will transform us and the world. The message puts it this way. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we heard first Christ, first of Christ, and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs for us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. It's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, the message of your salvation, found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. This signet from God is the first installment on what's to come, a reminder that we'll get everything God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. May our lives love and bless the one who first loved and blessed us. And may we and the world be transformed by that love so that we become the blessing for the world. Amen.
John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was, was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. Will you, I am well pleased. Now we'll be reading from Philippians in your pew Bible, page 187, if you'd like to join along. Not that I have already obtained this, righteousness or resurrection, or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, laying aside that which lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Kumbaya, my Lord. Well, as Elizabeth Taylor said to her seventh husband, <laughs> don't worry, I won't keep you long. <laughs> On this summer morning, I want us to think about these two readings, which Anne read so well. They book in the meaning of being a Christian in my mind. The first one, when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, has always caught my attention because Jesus was not the only one baptized. He got in line with the rest of humanity, and to me that's a very significant teaching about Jesus. He got in line. He could have spent the night at the Jordan Hilton and had room service. But he did not. He got in line with you and me and all the people from Jerusalem and thereabouts. He chose to be like that. He chose to live like us and endure as we must do. The second scripture puts us in that line and gives the line a purpose, a purpose of forgetting, or what I think are better terms, of laying aside that which lies behind and pressing forward to the high calling of Christ Jesus. Two examples of what it means to belong to a church, to be baptized into a fellowship, to make the choice to be part of this line, pay our dues, share our talents, like these people, Come faithfully because others need us to be here and support each other as best we can. We've just celebrated 275 years. Well, what does that mean? Does it only mean that we hold this building together, patch the roof, pray for a Jim Belial to take care of us, <laughs> paint the ceiling, Buy a new organ, which works when it wants to. <laughs> Peel the bells for a long time. No, it means the people. It means there have been people for years and years who have sought God's spirit in this place. 
It means getting in line with Jesus and doing our best. Fred Craddock was a nationally, internationally known theologian. He grew up in Southern Appalachia 85 years ago. His family was poor, his father was an alcoholic. Church was nothing he knew anything about as a child, but he had a best friend who told him about church. Fred was only about eight and the friend was 82, but they would sit together and the friend would tell him what church was like. Church, said old Will, is beautiful. It may not look like much on the outside, but on the inside it's beautiful, like much of what God's teaching is, better and more beautiful on the inside. Oh, it has the best feeling about it. And when you go, you always want to sit still and close your eyes and listen. If you do, you will hear the praying and the preaching. And then, when you hear the music, you can open your eyes and look up at the ceiling and you'll see angels up there and stars and clouds and a beautiful sky and if you're lucky, an angel will come out from behind a cloud with a blessing box and maybe open the box and let some of the blessings fall on you. Oh, go there sometime. Go there and listen. A little while later, old Will died, and Fred's mother took him to church to go to the funeral. They walked because they did not own a car. And when Fred got to the outside of that building, he was amazed, for it was just a clairvoy building, a little white building set up on cinder blocks. It needed a coat of paint, and its roof lines say, who could be inside? They went in, and Fred remembered that old Will had told him to keep his eyes shut and listen. Well, he heard the moaning and the praying, and the crying, and all that. And then he heard the singing. Oh, it sounded like a thousand voices of angels, and he had to open his eyes. And he looked up at the ceiling, and sure enough, there were stars up there. And there were angels and clouds, and the ceiling was blue. And would you believe it, from behind the cloud came an angel carrying a blessing box, and opened the blessing box, and down upon Fred's shoulders came the gold dust in the shape of a star, and it landed on his shoulder. And do you know, said Fred, this very famous theologian, do you know, I have had to stand tall for the rest of my life, lest that blessing fall off. Isn't that what it means to be in line with Jesus? To stand tall all our lives so the blessing will stay upon our shoulders. Think of Mrs. Swayze and Herbert Lyman. They were members of this church a long time ago. I can remember them. You know I could. <laughs> Richard and I can remember them and Myrna can remember them, but I won't pick on the rest of you. Anyway, Minna had to have a rubber ring to sit on, and I can remember her walking up that side aisle carrying her rubber ring to sit on during the service. And old H.B., he would laugh and laugh and tell stories and enjoy the twice monthly church, church suppers we had downstairs. Now, it just so happened that they died in 1945, three weeks from one another. And what I remember about that time was that the others in the church wondered how they could keep the church going without those two. In the Chester Hill Church that I served sometimes, there was the story of old Joel Sherwood and his place in line there. There was a time when that church nearly collapsed. They had no minister and no money. But they kept going because Joe Sherwood 
drove his buggy to church every Sunday morning and stopped and picked up the neighborhood children and took them with him to church. And then in the back corner of the church by the furnace, where they'd stay warm, he taught them the stories of the Old Testament and of Jesus. And they remembered that and they kept going. That was Joe's blessing on Joe's shoulder and he shared its light. Some of you may remember Mildred Cook, who was a member here. She grew up in this church, married, moved away, had three children, and then divorced. Because of the divorce and her need to work for a living, her three children were brought here to live with their uncle and aunt while she worked in Connecticut during the week. But she'd come up every weekend and see her family and she'd teach Sunday school. I remember going to Sunday school one summer morning in 1944 and hearing her excitement and the excitement of her children as they were going to go to see the circus in Hartford that week. The day they went was the day the arsonist touched a torch to the tent and the whole place went up in flames in so short a time that many were burned to death and many maimed for life. Mildred lost two of her children in that fire and spent six months in the hospital herself recovering from the burns that covered most of her body. But she carried on and she kept the star on her shoulder polished. She retired back here and worked at Ann August in Northampton in the, in the bookkeeping department. She was in church every Sunday and if you saw her, you would not think she had ever had a problem in her life. Her star was bright. She was in the line and she was pressing forward towards God's call in Jesus. Nobody doubted that. Bill Gray's mother had Guillaume Barre disease and ended up struggling for every single breath she took. And my memory of her in her late days were that on her breath, with each time, it would be praise God. Pretty good when you were struggling to live from one breath to the next. Richard's mother had four sons. Only two of them were well. She kept her star straight by shining, writing, writing about the daily events in her life and turning them into humor. Using the pen name of Mrs. Muggleday, remember that? When Rich, who actually was one of her well sons, even though I've won it sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> took her flying on the first day after he got his pilot's license. She, I can just picture that, having my kid learn how to fly and take me for the first flight of he ever made. Well, she went. And when she got over Southampton, he had to turn the plane and she said, oh, don't do it, don't do it. But she wrote about that activity and, and under this Mrs. Muddle Day title, and she had titled, sent it to the Springfield Union under the heading of Mrs. Muddle Day Gets High. <laughs> she also left notes for us when she passed away. Notes that were full of humor, like, I only knew what true happiness was until I got married. <laughs> and then it was too late. <laughs> or, having children is hereditary. Chances are, if your folks didn't have any, you won't either. <laughs> She lived a long and productive life in this community, helping write the history of this town and helping do many things. And she was a small woman, but she stood straight and tall and walked humbly and with grace, carrying on her shoulder this great burden of care and disappointment with half her children not being well. Many of you remember Frank Cohen, but I wonder if you know that Frank got married during World War II to a lovely lady from Virginia. And he came home from work one day 
who found her, find her dead upon the floor in the first year of his marriage. He went on to get married again and have four children and a good family, but I knew he carried that load for the rest of his days. You saw a tall man with stooped shoulders, but you also saw someone who stood tall and lighted the lives of the rest of us by his grace and his goodness and his common sense. These are just a few of the folks we meet in this Jesus line, and all of them are pressing forward toward the mark of the high calling of Christ. When they chose this line, they took upon themselves their own special stars and walked tall, lest they fall off. They did well, but they are not alone. We have all got our own stars and our own stories, and the requirement to be in this Jesus line is to press forward, leaving behind. I didn't say I had to forget it. I know I cannot myself forget that Hartford fire, but you have to leave it behind and move forward. And what does that mean to us? It means what it says, leaving the past, pressing on, dropping past hurts and disappointments, leaving behind betrayals and sharp words, forgetting our mistakes and the mis missteps of others, leaving behind great sorrow and great tragedy. For we have a scar on our shoulder and a purpose in our lives. Walk, as Fred Craddock said, Paul, all your lives to keep the star from falling off. Jesus was one of us. His spirit is still in us. He was God's beloved, just as the dove proclaimed when he was baptized. But we too are God's beloved, and we are asked to get in line with Jesus. It does not set us apart from others. It does not make us free from sin. It does not make things go the way we wish they would. It does not mean we can look at others and judge as if we mattered more than they. It means we get into the Jordan River and keep our heads above the water and remain with the purpose in our lives of keeping the star on our shoulders. This church had an anniversary and we're right to be proud of our old age. But it only be happened because of its people and its vision and its pressing on. We need to remember that. When we joined this faith, we stepped into a long line and Jesus is still in it. And we walk together towards his goal, laying aside the past and envisioning his call upon our shoulders in the future and forever. Amen and amen. Thank you.